I would like to give you all a, a great big warm welcome. Um, this is our, our second um, opening event for the inaugural Democracy and Governance Practice Retreat. Um, my name is Maria and I lead the, the Open Governance Network for Europe, which is initiated jointly by the OGP, the Open Government Partnership and Democratic Society, which aims to connect, drive and uh, uh, connect and drive, debate, learning, and innovation around open government principles with the aim of improving civic participation, um, also transparency and accountability in the European Union. As the, the head of the, the leading the Open Governance Network for Europe, I'm also leading this, um, this very first democracy and governance practice retreat, um, which is the first of its kind for, for public servants and civil society across Europe. We heard a bit of the context and the objectives of the retreat in our first opening session just before this about how the 10 partners, including the OECD and the, the Open Government Partnership, the OGP, have, have uh, behind this retreat um, aimed to help civil servants and civil society together to co-create better policy making and better public service with an eye toward building civic trust in institutions, or rebuilding that civic trust, and ultimately building stronger democracies, which are better fit for crisis and beyond. In this, the first session earlier today, we explored the global trends that are impacting democracy throughout the pandemic and, and throughout the, the past 10 years, and how those different trends will impact Europe. How we also zoomed in on Portugal with the Secretary of State for Administrative Modernization. And we explored how Portugal's governments are reshaping through the pandemic for a stronger democracy. And we drew, we drew out lessons for, for European governments and institutions to, to be better able to support better democracies going forward. In this session, which is co-led by OGP and the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, we will look at how to strengthen European democracy through governance. Specifically, we're going to look at how more strategic and systematic approaches to, to uh, opening governance across different sectors and different services can create a more transformative impact on, on all of our systems and societies for stronger democracies going forward. I'll give you a bit of context to, to help kick us off. The need to protect and strengthen European democracies has never been greater than it is today. The pandemic, as we've heard many times, has shown us that people across the globe want more open and more transparent, more accountable and participatory public policies and services. Citizens today are better informed than ever and want to have more of a say in the design and the implementation of the decisions and policies that shape their lives. Now, since the, the creation of the OGP in, in 2011, a transnational movement has grown which has pushed for more open government. And, and recent data has been collected by the OECD shows that this, this topic of open government has become very prominent on many countries' policy agendas. So many countries have, have created dedicated open government offices and more and more of them are taking initiatives to foster the move towards an open government culture in their public sectors. Since the start, we have 78 countries, including 29 of the OECD's 38 countries that have, that have joined the OGP and are designing biannual action plans for reform. Now, these open government reforms have, have absolutely resulted in improved government transparency, and they've facilitated more and better citizen participation in many countries across Europe and globally. But more work needs to be done in order to, to unleash that, that full potential of open government and leverage the power of this unique community and also leverage the reforms that have already been made and the gains made so far from government and civil society. Now today, more than ever, reformers have to move to that next level to, to, to fully strengthen our democracies and foster citizen trust. More and more countries are designing holistic open government strategies in order to achieve more transformative impacts and in order to make government the primary open government, that is the primary way in which their state operates. So in this session, we aim to discuss the ways in which the next generation of open government reforms can help European governments foster 
stronger and better democracies, and ones that match citizen expectations that can face current but also future crises. I am delighted to be joined here by, by four uh, wonderful panelists. And um, here we have Elsa Pilichowski, who is the Director for Public Governance at the OECD, Paul Mawson, who is the Chief of Country Support at the Open Government Partnership. We also have Minister Sirpa Patero, the Minister of Local Government in the Government of Finland, and Sonia Reid, who is the Assistant Secretary for Digital and Services Policy uh, in the Treasury Board Secretariat in Canada. So we'll be joined by, by both the OECD, the OEGP, and two um, champion reformers for, for a conversation going forward. I, I want to just give also a, a bit of, of uh, explanation on the dynamics of this session. So we'll be, we'll be dividing this conversation into three different parts. And to start, I will be delighted to lead a Q&A with all the speakers. And these questions will help to, to, to paint the framing, to identify what we've achieved in, in making governments more open. We'll take stock of what's, what we've learned and we'll set our sights for what's yet to be done. And then I would like to zoom in on the next round of questions on what open government strategies actually look like in practice from both a global view with our speakers from OGP and OECD and also from up close and on, this, um, on everyday life um, in, from our, our colleagues from Finland and in Canada uh, through the eyes of our Minister Petro and Ms. Reid. Then I would very much like to open up the floor to you, our participants, um, for questions and comments, all of you. The chat is open, our panelists will see them, so please do send your questions, your comments, and we will read them and hope to incorporate them in the last part of our session today. Just two points for housekeeping. Um, the session is, is being recorded, and I, I welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat, your, your, your name, your country, so we can see and how you make up a broad range of reformers and to share your questions and comments again via chat. So turning over to our dear speakers, I would just ask, uh, we, have, we have quite an agenda today over the next 90 minutes. Um, I would just ask you to be brief in your remarks so we can have as much uh, of a dynamic conversation as possible. Without further ado, I am pleased to, to turn over to Q&A. So um, I would like to start with you, Paul. Um, first, thank you for joining us in this inaugural Democracy and, and Governance Practice Retreat. Um, I would like to ask you to look back over OGP's decade of global work. Now, with this view in mind, can you share with us your reflections on what kind of government reforms have been most successful in the wrong run, in the long run, and why? And perhaps on the other hand, what are the key challenges you see for, for change at scale? Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Maria. And that's um... There's quite a combination of asks you have. Be brief and talk about 10 years, uh, which, is, which is challenging. I'll give it a try. Um, now, in the 10 years since OGP started, we've seen a big growth in, in, in numbers and diversity of governments and civil society using OGP, as well as a change in the levels of, of and parts of government that joined this, uh, this partnership and the policy areas it covers. Since we started 10 years ago, we've grown from the initial 11 countries and a handful of NGOs to 78 national governments, uh, 76 local governments and, and, and institutions and thousands of civil society organizations, but also parliaments, uh, audit offices, et cetera. Now, these government and civil society reformers jointly uh, that are at the heart of, of what OGP is in the end have co-created and implemented um, a whole range of commitments to make governments more open, inclusive and responsive and accountable to citizens. Now, they have made a lot of progress in the first decade um, in strengthening democracy. But if you unpack it, you see that some areas and some aspects of open government have been more, uh, more successful. And I'll come to that. But if you, if you started what we, what we set out to do as OGP, in short, it is about creating space for reformers inside the system that believe that opening up government to citizens, input and oversight gets you a government that is more credible, effective and efficient. Putting dialogue with citizens back at the heart of government can shape better government 
and restore trust, which I think is some um, one of the key challenges that many of our countries are facing with. Or in the words of one of our founders, President Obama, a government that truly serves its citizens rather than serving itself. Now, what are some of these examples we've seen? There are 4,500 commitments, but um, some of them are really, I would say, uh, game-changing big reforms. For example, citizens being empowered to shape the budgets and policies that, um, that touch their lives, like the CD Madrid uh, has done, but after Madrid, a hundred other places followed. Or monitor the big funds and public services through Italy's open coercione. Anti-corruption initiatives like Prozoro and Dozoro in the Ukraine, um, and Dozoro is the, is the citizen monitoring element of it, have transformed procurement in Ukraine, combating corruption, but also um, creating a level playing field for the private sector in its dealings with government. And lobbying reform, for example, in Chile and Ireland, um, have shown a light on um, the political influence activities um, and, and democratized, in a way, access to government. These are just a few examples of successes that I think showcase how OGP members worldwide are building better democracy beyond the ballot box, inspiring many others while doing so. Now, these game-changing reforms um, have been too far and few between, though. The volume of commitments made by OGP members, those 4,500, does not always translate into societal impact. Why? In my view, three reasons. One, commitments could still be better designed and implemented. Many commitments have not been fully implemented despite the promise in the face of political, financial, technical challenges. Second, many of the commitments made are about making government more transparent which is very important, but far fewer of these commitments are actually about participation, accountability, and government responsiveness. And a third challenge I would say is that OGP and open government are still more of a, a niche boutique product used by a few connoisseurs in government rather than a mainstream approach to doing government differently for the whole of government. So I said, our ambition is to change the culture of government, not as a goal in itself, but um, really to strengthen democracies and societies and down the line make lives better for ordinary citizens. We've learned a lot in the first decade, uh, what you asked for, and I think that lays a solid foundation for the decade ahead and for the challenges that we're trying to solve ahead. We know, for example, which are the key policy areas that we need to tackle, and many of them are in the anti-corruption sphere. We know where the domestic and international traction is. We know where what we've learned and what support is needed. Our latest research, to give you one example of 10 years uh, of OGP data, shows um, two important things that I find very interesting. One, um, strong and inclusive co-creation processes indeed lead to better designed and more ambitious commitments. And second, that if the collaboration continues during implementation, that we get better results. Simply put, if done well, participation delivers better results. So, OGP's role has been to provide that support to its members through the years, right? The support unit, my, my team, and to foster this international learning and action. OGP is constantly raising the bar, helping shape initiatives, pushing for quality reforms, measures for tackling process, tracking progress, and, but also raising awareness through campaigns and building broader coalitions of reformers on both sides, setting up global norms um, bottom up. Um, let me let me come to a close because I know you have, have many questions and I do want to say something about Europe, but perhaps we do that later in the conversation. Um, in the end, what we're talking about today is about reimagining and strengthening democracy, right? And for that, you don't just need strong institutions and elections. You need the rule of law in practice, not just on paper. You need trust and dialogue, and you need governments that actually deliver for citizens. There's much to be done in the second decade of OGP with partners at the national level, um, like, like Finland and Canada today on the call, but also international partners like the OECD, especially to harness um, and scale up innovations about citizen participation. I really think that's um, perhaps the most important next after the transparency that we've made so much progress on. And to improve and expand government accountability and responsiveness to citizens. So it's the participation, the accountability and the responsiveness that I think should be at the heart of the challenges going forward. But even countries or regions or municipalities can't go at it alone. We need to come together 
build coalitions to learn and to achieve better together. So in this retreat, I think that is exactly what you're trying to do, Maria. And I think that's what, what is so interesting about today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I think you've, you've kicked us off very well and helped frame sort of how far we've come and, and what's uh, the work there is to do. Um, and especially to highlighting this, this need for um, more strategic and structured um, open government reform going forward. So next, I would like to, um, I'd like to turn to our, our Minister Patero from Finland, um, who is, there we are, hi, good afternoon, Minister. Um, so Minister, we understand that, that Finland has, has just last year adopted its first, what we're calling open government strategy. And this strategy, I understand, aimed to build trust and security, but also confidence among citizens in the future of, of Finland, among its uh, citizens, so that it harnessed an open government approach as a means to do so. So I'd like to ask you, in your experience, can you tell us what it took to design and, and lift and put this strategy into action? And, and perhaps also zooming out, if you could tell us how this strategy is helping to strengthen Finland's democracy more broadly. Okay, thank you. Very big questions, and <laughs> maybe I can tell you something about. But first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's always nice to get the conversation with these very topic questions. As you say, we launched last uh, December our open government strategy, and of course, it's also committed and our open government action plan. It's not only a strategy, we have an action plan immediately in the same time. And of course, it's important that we have this kind of long term vision and priorities to the next 10 years, how to ensure open government and through that to safeguard our democracy. Of course, the design is strategy, we also try to make it possible to many people as, as possible. It, it wasn't so easy because we also have this uh, COVID and we, we made it in any way. We organized this kind of regional dialogues in eight different areas so that municipal leaders participate there. We also organize these kind of meetings with the civil society organizations. And furthermore, we use the information to get from the lockdown dialogues during the 2020. We make this all in the same time. So we have collect over thousand participants for very different kind of backgrounds of society. But like you mentioned, the vision of uh, our open government strategy is that our government is the key resource in Finnish society. It builds trust, security, confidence, and of course the future among the citizens. The, with this uh, vision, we want to say that uh, even through, we have these kind of big challenges, uh, uh, like this kind of pandemic, climate change, aging society, we have to core strength like open, open government that uh, our resources in coming years. People have to trust us, the government, uh, and this all. We need these key resources so that we can fulfill our promises to the society of building better democracy for all. In, in our strategy, we have this kind of four priorities, how we consist strategy. We like to keep it uh, on, not so many, so we have <laughs> decided only, only these four so we can make a focus to them. The first one is reinforcing dialogue in society. The second one is promoting everyone's right to understand 
and be understood. The third one is ensuring truth, leadership and competence that everyone has opportunity to participate. And the fourth one is promoting open government also internationally, as we have done today. Uh, just to maybe one example, how it means in practice in, in, in this implementation. Uh, we like to promote this that everyone's right to understand is the, is the key of our, one of our priorities. Here in practice, we will put more emphasis in systematically and proactively increasing plain language, language skill. Studies how so us that in Finland it's 14% of our people who need plain language. They can't understand this the official language. And therefore it's used with the public sector organizations need to be intensified. Otherwise, we are not able to provide services and give out information in language that we could accessible to all. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not fair that we speak that kind of language that people can't understand. So they can't be here. So that's one of the examples. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for, for this, this in-depth um, insight into the, the strategic process um, and how you've connected it to, to ongoing dialogues around the lockdown, um, but also how you're connecting it across country, across the, the government, across civil society, and also internationally. Um, thank you for that overview. And uh, with that, I would also, I would like to turn to, to Elsa. Um, now, from, from your perspective uh, at the OECD, um, could, could you give us a sense of, of this, this, broader, this, this broader, more strategic approach that you've been working on? As, as uh, we, we've already heard time and time again, people are demanding new and, and, and better opportunities to not only influence, um, but as we heard with, with, the, with Minister Patro, the, 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 the opportunity to monitor public decisions that impact their lives. Um, now, based, based on your work, how can this, this whole of government approach um, to open government strategy support democratic governments in this endeavor and to, to turn strength in turn to strengthen those democracies for, for crisis now and, and in the future? Thank you very much, Maya, and good afternoon to all. Um, it's great to be in this panel of, um, of um, champions, as, as you said, Maria, in the, in the introductions, first the OGP, but also Finland, Canada, which are really uh, taking uh, the lead on many of these areas um, today. And that's, uh, that's great. It's an honor. And we're working also closely with the two countries, also with the OGP in a long term partnership, but um, with these two countries to, to move forward. So let me take a step back a little bit uh, to mention also that uh, for the first time in I think in the in the history of the OECD, we have uh, members uh, have agreed to uh, to have a rather large initiative called uh, Reinforcing Democracy, uh, and this for it to reach, I would say, a collective of 38 countries that consider together that it's a priority for the OECD. It means that uh, there's an issue. Uh, there's an issue that is. Uh, that is not only looking at an issue in countries that have fragile democracies or, or difficult traditional democracies with their, with their own systems, but uh, it's also looking at the very advanced, very solid democracies, which also consider that there's something going on that needs to be tackled. So this it's all started with like the, the realization that public satisfaction, public satisfaction with the way democracies are functioning has decreased significantly since the, the mid 1990s, that threats to democracy such as uh, declining voter turnout in my own country yesterday, we had one of the low, lowest voter, turn, voter turnouts in uh, regional elections ever, uh, deteriorating trust, but not only deteriorating trust, but higher levels of mistrust and distrust with groups uh, dissociating themselves from, uh, from traditional uh, democratic uh, mechanisms and traditional democratic systems. 
greater polarization and public backlash to reforms. Um, it all started with this becoming a big issue for all countries, um, including in Europe, in the very core of Europe. Um, public uh, perception of, of how governments are serving their citizens and how they have uh, responded to key national and, and global challenges really lies at the heart of this malaise. Uh, so at the OECD, with the Public Governance Committee, we've, uh, we've really identified a number of new and emerging governance challenges that explain, at least partially, uh, the lower levels of trust and larger groups of people dissociating themselves from, uh, from traditional democratic per, uh, processes. So our reinforcing democracy agenda is built around three pillars. One is really uh, fighting disinformation. So that includes part of it is not has not much to do with open government itself, but designing the right regulatory tools for that, but also communication and information tools. The second big pillar, which is really the core pillar uh, that we're looking at today, even if there are, you know, it also influences all three pillars, but it's about representation and decision making. And the third pillar is about how do we increase government capacities to thrive in the digital economy and tackle global challenges because we've also realized that the lack of trust is because citizens feel that their domestic governments are not always able to address global challenges which they are not alone if you want so this this issue about global governance and citizens owning what's happening at, at the global level is also core to to this issue so reforms that aim at reinforcing the open government principles of tr transparency, integrity, accountability, stakeholder participation, as they have just been mentioned uh, by Paul, are very much at the, at the center of, of this pillar two of our democracy agenda. The, the global open government movement has played an important role in putting key issues uh, surrounding democratic fitness and innovation on the international agenda. Data collected by the OECD through the a survey that we carried out in 2020 on open government shows that more than 50% of OGP action plans already make a direct connection between open government initiatives and reinforcing democracy. Moreover, uh, data also shows that countries are increasingly strengthening their participation agendas in order to better listen to citizens' needs and strengthen their trust in government. Uh, for example, over 85% of OECD countries of our 38 OEC countries have created holistic participation portals. And since its creation in 2011, the OECD has been working closely, uh, very, very closely with the OGP uh, to support our members and partners in, uh, in their open government agendas. Uh, the global open government movement is, is really today at a very critical juncture. Now more than ever, we need to show that government reforms can have really a transformative impact and can make an essential contribution to make our democracy stronger and more resilient. Um, our research also shows that open government uh, initiatives are still implemented in a scattered and ad hoc manner uh, without consciously contributing to, a broad, to broader national policy objectives. Um, of course, this, uh, as you can imagine, these uh, scattered uh, approaches often fail to recognize the systemic impact that the concerted open government approach can, can have on the machinery of government and on the functioning of democracies. So it's, we feel that it's really now time to take the, the next step. Uh, and in order to take full advantage of the benefits of open government reforms and, and to, uh, to prevent uh, scattered uh, initiative and provide, if you want, an umbrella, uh, we have a recommendation at the OECD, which is a legal instrument. It's called the recommendation on the Council on, uh, of the Council on Open Government, which suggests that all our member and partner countries develop their own holistic open government strategy, um, which puts the principles of open government at the center of public sector reform and provides a clear roadmap for, for more tangible impact. The strategy also complements and strengthens the OGP action plan in countries that are members of OGP uh, by aligning existing strategies and initiative and giving a common vision, if you want, to, uh, to the open uh, government agenda. And we're also very pleased to see that uh, more and more OEC countries, including Finland with the minister today, uh, Canada, uh, Sonia is here today, uh, Colombia, Norway, Lithuania, and Italy are already designing and or uh, implementing open government strategies 
uh, and threats that uh, we we're, we're hearing uh, we're looking for to uh, to also uh, 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 hearing the experiences from Canada and Finland uh, today. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pilichowski. That's a, a fantastic overview of, um, again, I think picking up from, from where Paul was saying, in, in, in a sense, this is, this is uh, we've achieved so much and we still have so much to, left to do, but really zooming in on, on strategically ways that we can, we can build out, um, scale up, and, and also communicate um, the, the, the different reforms necessary to, to deliver more transformative impact. Um, and this open government strategy um, process is, is, is a very promising way in which to do so. Um, I think going forward also bringing, carrying this, this need to, um, to connect the, the strategy with the action to the, the broader narrative uh, around, around strengthening democracy is, is an ongoing process. But um, we also heard this from in the previous session from the Secretary of State in Portugal. Um, and, and from here, I'd like to, to bring it back to, to a, our, our country experience with this process. We heard from, from the Minister Patero about the, the experience that just started in December. And now um, turning our focus to Canada, I'd like to turn to you, Ms. Reed, um, to, to ask you about your process. So I understand that Canada is, is currently in the process of designing its first integrated whole of government, uh, open government strategy. How do you envision this strategy in supporting the Canadian government in better connecting to citizens? And, and also, can you tell us a bit of some of the, the broader impacts that you hope to achieve in that broader narrative? Certainly, thank you, Maria. Um, so I just, I think I wanna start by talking um, a little bit about how we, we see the vision. Um, and, you know, I think I know, uh, and as everybody around this table will know, like, as we've we've gone through the, the, the situation with COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, we've become increasingly aware of the high expectations of citizens and being able to participate in government decision making, and to be informed of the reasons about why decisions are being made. And this need for transparency, it's not an easy expectation to meet it's actually a very, very hard expectation to meet. Um, and it, but it's, it's so critical and central to fostering citizens trust towards democratic institutions. Um, you know, fostering trust uh, through increased transparency, accountability and participation of, has always been part of the backbone of how we serve Canadians. And, uh, you know, this is visible through the work that we've done in terms of the open government partnership and delivering in the national action plans. Um, and we've seen through the implementation of national action plans that they've resulted in great gains in a lot of important areas across the government of Canada. But the individual reforms, the projects and the pilots, they don't by themselves lead to the integration of open government processes and principles across government and into the government activities and the culture of government institutions. Um, we've learned that, that although the national action plans are really, really fantastic for advancing public facing reforms, um, the things that citizens care about and the things that are really visible to them, they aren't actually enough to mainstream open government consistently across government. Um, because systemic is change is actually needed beyond these individual reforms, uh, we have to look at a different set of tools and mechanisms. So with the strategy, we want to take the experience and the maturity of our involvement in the OGP processes and the national action plans and apply it towards government consistently. So these strengths include fostering greater direct involvement with citizens and moving the government to be increasingly open by default. Um, so in terms of the uh, broader impacts, as I've already noted, one of the biggest goals that we're going to have is really striving for uh, ensuring that the open government principles are integrated, um, so that they're integrated in how we do business in the government of Canada in a more consistent manner. Um, with this in, in mind, uh, a key part will be establishing the conditions for government to be open by default. So this has been a key priority for a number of years, and we've seen this uh, in terms of uh, public commitments across the government. But openness by default actually requires a strategy that focuses on addressing internal culture and the infrastructure of government. So not just the infrastructure of uh, you know, our, our, our institutions, but 
our actual technical infrastructure in some ways, our information management and our, our digital infrastructure. Um, we have to de-risk openness, but ensure that privacy and security are protected at the same time so that people don't aren't hesitant um, to know when and what they can release and what they can push out and how they can engage. So our strategy is really gonna be designed around helping us build the human and physical infrastructure that is required to truly mainstream open government across government institutions. It includes creating expectations and opportunities for citizens and users to be informed of and work with governments on the policies and services that affect them. And as part of the strategy, and because I'm a public servant, I get to say things like this, we're going to be developing metrics. <laughs> so actually measuring, yeah, exactly, measuring and evaluating um, how our activities are contributing to long-term vision. And so this is actually a really important part of our strategy because we want to be able to ensure that our strategy stays relevant through ongoing reviews and is flexible enough so that we can pivot. So the activities that aren't delivering impact, we can change them and we can refocus our efforts on those that do deliver impact. And that's why measurement and uh, is, is, is actually such an important part of how we wanna see this strategy rolling out. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, this, I think for giving us the overview, but also giving us a very rare glimpse into, to the, as you mentioned, the, the human and the technical infrastructure that really, um, that it takes to, to mainstream some of these big ideas and concepts uh, and practices. But also to thanks for giving us the the, the challenges and and some of the trade offs that you mentioned like um, the 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 need to to show openness um, by default but also while protecting the the privacy and the security of citizens and users um, I think that that this such a such a an endeavor is fraught with with such um, with such conflicting. Uh, interests and needs to, to bear in mind. Um, so it's it's very good to get a sense of, of the interworkings of how this is all being thought through. Um, I mean, thanks to our first round of, of contributions from all of you have been really loaded and given us a, a, a great big sense of um, how how big the, the work is that needs to be done um, and, and how some of the, the initiatives and efforts are really starting to, to, to design and, and package and, and sort of take take apart the puzzle pieces to, to be able to, to create more, um, more steadfast and, and longer term strategic cultures of, of openness. I'd like to, in this next round, I'd like to turn our, our focus or zoom in rather to what these, these, these reforms and these kinds of strategies mean in practice. We've already heard a little bit from, from Sonia just now and, and also from the, the Minister Patero uh, from the, the experience so far in building this from the ground up, uh, or rather building this from, from achievement so far. Um, I, I would like to, to start another round, zooming in on, on this quality of, of practice and making, actually perhaps focusing on that human and the, the technical infrastructures for, for making this happen. First, um, I will start with, with Elsa again, and um, I'll start with, with the OECD because it's, it's known as, as the, the sort of club of good practices, and it has collected numerous international, so many examples uh, surrounding open government reforms. Can you, can you name some that show how open government policies and practice can generate greater trust in public institutions? And, and perhaps what are some of these new trends that the OECD has identified? Thank you very much, Maria, again, and, uh, and a lot of thinking is going into this session, so that this is great. So indeed, yes, we, we collect data, evidence, we share good practices, that's, that's what our core business is at the OECD. So we, we have collected that an important amount of, uh, of data and evidence, uh, which indeed shows that uh, open government reforms can generate greater trust and as well as legitimacy in public decision making. Uh, we also presently uh, developing the first set of, uh, of indicators to measure the level of openness uh, of governments. This will be ready uh, later on. But to, to give you some examples, uh, the first uh, three three different types of, uh, of examples. The first is related to what we call the, the deliber deliberative wave. So it's very difficult to do for, non, for to say for non-speakers, for not native speakers. So this deliberative wave uh, really describes really a, a trend of, of public authorities from all levels of government 
increasingly turning to citizens assemblies, juries, panels, and other representative deliberative, deliberative processes uh, to, to tackle complex policy problems. Uh, they convene groups of people representing a wide cross section of society for at least one full day and very often much longer to learn, deliberate, and develop, develop uh, collective deliberations. Of one example from, uh, from Ireland, for example, the, the Irish citizens' assemblies show that uh, citizen deliberation can help governments get, navigate the issues that normally divide us. They tackled issues of same-sex same marriage and abortion and were also important uh, precursors to the referendum plural, the referendums that, uh, that ushered in history change on these two issues that were very much polarizing uh, Irish society beforehand. Uh, another type of, uh, of example different is uh, what we call targeted, targeted transparency. Um, today, I mean, of course, access to information laws are present in 128 countries, including 37 or 38 of our members. Um, and we recognize, and Paul said it a little bit earlier, that transparency does not translate into stronger institutions or higher levels of trust automatically. Um, and so an increasing number of countries are implementing targeted transparency initiatives. Uh, this refers to the use of uh, disclosure of information as a means to attain or improve other policy uh, objectives, for example, decreasing violence among youth, fighting overweight. Uh, one example is from Canada uh, that we have uh, the, the Royal uh, Canadian Mounted Police uh, established a targeted transparency action plan with the objective of improving policing policies, making use of data and information for the protection of civil liberties and rights, and, and forging a relationship with society based on trust. And after the, the Black Lives Matter uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protest, the, the police published key data sets to allow an informed debate on policing in, uh, in, in Canada. Uh, this targeted disclosure of information about the police is, is we, we believe, creating the environment for citizens and police to have a dialogue on some, on sensitive issues such as racism, biases, and, and violence. And then we have from the COVID-19 times, many examples that have uh, come in about uh, co-creation and finding answers uh, to the pandemic um, with citizens uh, uh, finding the answers themselves and in partnership with uh, the government. Uh, we have some example from my own country, from France, um, and thanks to the information and data published by the, by the government, the collective of citizens developed a COVID tracker and website called Vitmados, uh, two platforms used by, by millions of citizens, as well as the media, the government and, and other agencies to get verified information about the crisis and also to book uh, vaccination appointments. So all these, these examples are, are populating um, our our reports, and, and we're trying to get more of those uh, in the future to, to support government sharing in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa, um, for giving us a couple of, of fantastic examples um, of how, how these strategies are really put to, to excellent use um, from all across the world, Canada, uh, Ireland, and, um, and, and Finland. And um, I, I think, it would be great to to zoom to another uh, of our, our multinational organizations and and hear from Paul next. Um, Paul, this year the, the world is facing a number of, of global crises, as we are very well aware now. Um, can how do you think reformers ta can tackle these crises through open government approaches, and and perhaps looking beyond the pandemic uh, response? What do you think we reformers need for for renewal? for reforms at the, the breadth and the scale that's needed for more of a transformative impact as we've been talking about throughout the session. Paul, over to you. Thanks, Maria. And it, I think it's a nice flow of, of what we've been talking about, right? Where sort of, you know, the, the, the reforms being too far and few and, and, and sort of um, both hearing from, from Canada um, and, and uh, as well as from Elsa about how do you get to a certain skill, right? I think that is, that is one of those um, key questions we have to sort of try and answer. 
especially with these intense crises um, facing us. So I think scale is, is something to come back to in this, um, in this conversation because we all have great examples. And I, I took uh, definitely notes when Elsa was just speaking. Uh, there were a few new ones there that I didn't know yet. Um, but how do we get beyond the example? I think that's, um, that's what I want to sort of focus on. So yeah, so that in our thinking, there are five crises hitting us at the same time, right? The world was already complex pre-pandemic, but now we have you know, this most devastating pandemic health crisis in 100 years, um, leading to the worst economic crisis since the Second World War. We already had um, a crisis of inequality, but it's laid bare and worsened in a way by, um, by the pandemic. The climate crisis hasn't gone away yet, um, clearly. And then there's the one that some of us have already touched on, which is the crisis of democracy, in which we're talking about today, reflecting the rise in uh, authoritarianism, um, more than 15 years of consecutive decline in civic space and civil liberties, and those low levels of trust we've been, we've been talking about, which have been even worsened by the pandemic. So what is the silver line there? What's hopeful, right? Um, well, one is, and, and Elsa had it in her third example, um, is how citizens were part of the immediate response um, to the pandemic, the first wave, but also the, the second wave. I think that's really interesting, as well as sort of, you know, the, um, the coming back of the experts um, in a way. So that's a hopeful one. But we also have seen citizens take to the streets um, and the ballot box to demand fairer, more inclusive, accountable democracy. Uh, we've seen political headwinds shifting and some of those autocrats actually moving out of office. Um, so those are, those are hopeful. Um, we're innovating collectively, I think, like crazy. You hit it in all the examples, um, whether it's Ireland or Canada, the lockdown dialogues, which is one of my favorites um, from Finland. But we're not yet changing the culture of government, right? And our collective imperative being to reimagine the societies and democracies we live in, to recalibrate some of the choices we made in the past. We have to capitalize on this moment exactly to, to scale and broaden up, a uh, broaden open government um, reforms. Now, the campaign we've had as, as OGP started as open response, open recovery, the immediate response and then the recovery coming right after. And we've added a third layer to it, which is open renewal, right? Which is, let's use this opportunity to, to, uh, to use the momentum to address some of the long standing systemic weaknesses of our societies including those that are um, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic and to build those better democracies in support of citizens, fit for the crisis and beyond. Now, we are calling on, on all the governments we work with and the civil society organization and the private sector and all the others for four things. And I'll quickly run through them. First, we call for bold reforms to fight corruption and capture. We need open budgets and open contracts and open company ownership a number of countries in Europe, um, including Ukraine and Latvia and Lithuania, published their COVID-19 contracts actually and providing citizen watchdogs the opportunity to follow the money. We also call on stakeholders to advance transparency and oversight in lobbying like in Chile and Ireland and in company ownership like in the UK and Armenia um, to ensure that bailouts and contracts are not captured by the politically connected. Um, according to some figures, governments have mobilized upward of $14 trillion in COVID-19 stimulus and safety nets. These historic investments in health and education and social protection and infrastructure really risk becoming um, wasteful liabilities that down the line, ordinary citizens and the poor have to pay for if we don't tackle corruption and capture. So that's the first one. The second one um, is we call on the community on the partnership to tackle the systemic inequalities, whether it's race or ethnicity or gender or education or income. And for that, you need to, we need to escalate reforms that are about access to justice, um, like uh, including historically marginalized groups like North Macedonia has done with the Roma, or that tackle these systemic inequalities uh, around income, like Germany has done by uh, monitoring the status of women in leadership positions, for example. Um, and to ensure that um, equality of access in vaccine distribution, so to reach um, all who are in need, not just to wealthy and powerful nations or individuals. So that's the second one. The third one is 
to make democracies more resilient, um, elections and beyond. We need to tackle the digital threats to democracy. Um, the Netherlands, for example, has taken strides to regulate political advertising. Canada and France have, um, in OGP, worked on improving the transparency and the accountability and the inclusiveness of public algorithms, which impact public services um, on a daily basis. Resilient democracies also require enhanced civic space protections, like Croatia, for example, has done by um, strengthening the legislative framework for transparency and the independent work of media, or Latvia, who has um, used OGP to enhance whistleblower protection mechanisms. For us, the, the scans of, of civic space that the OECD is doing uh, in Finland, in Portugal, and hopefully many countries will follow, are excellent because they can teach us a lot about how policies and public services impact our societies um, on and offline. And that links them to what um, the minister um, was talking about, about the plain language, which is one of my favorite to topics in, in open government. I think a lot starts with plain language and how we communicate with citizens. And the fourth one is we need to scale up the reforms that uh, reinvigorate a more citizen-centric democracy and to renew trust in government, which is a lot about this deliberative wave that Elsa was talking about. We call this democracy beyond the ballot box. It means citizens are empowered to shape and oversee uh, their governments between and beyond elections, right? And, and here we need participatory budgeting like we've seen in Scotland, but also Côte d'Ivoire, or participatory monitoring of education like in Finland or the citizen assemblies that have been so successful in Germany and the UK. Now, this is for me also what this retreat is about, right? Inspire, share, exchange, um, some of these things that have worked at the local level, the national level, and the EU level. In the end, OGP is about um, is a partnership of, of doers, of thinkers, of implementers. So the call to action, those four layers I was talking about, shouldn't be rhetoric. It is about each reformer in government and in civil society um, to advance the reforms needed to deliver the transformative change. But with that learning after 10 years that creating the space for the individual reformers will get you those scattered reforms that are inspiring, that are important, but are not necessarily changing the overall culture of government, moving us to a more proactive way of, um, of open government. This year is incredibly important for the community. There's 100 OGP members creating action plans. Um, if, if everyone on the call goes back to their OGP process and uses that process to come up with one additional inspiring uh, commitment on each of these four challenges, whether it's about anti-corruption, um, democratic uh, strengthening or inequality, then I think next year when we meet for the second retreat, we have many more examples about how open governments can actually better uh, serve their citizens. The challenges we see as a final sentence are, are so big um, that in my mind, no government can tackle um, them alone. That in itself, I think, is the value proposition for including citizens in government work. The challenges we're facing are so big that any government will need the eyes and the ears and the mouths and the muscles of citizens to help counter them. Back to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was a very comprehensive overview of, of, of course, many different areas for, for prioritizing reform. But really, I thank you very much for bringing these these different areas of reform down to the ground into into everyday everyday reform efforts that that can make uh, when added up and scaled um, can make a gigantic difference. Um, <clears throat> And you touched on, on one point in particular that I may, I may uh, pull into to the next question. Uh, that was on civic space. So I'd like to turn to our Minister Patero um, for a question about Finland and, and the civic space scan that you mentioned, Paul. Um, so Minister Patero, despite the important progress that's, that's been made in opening up governments that we've, we've heard throughout this conversation, we're also seeing, still seeing um, a paradoxical trend of closing civic space in Europe and the world. And Finland, however, stands comparative, comparatively very strong with regard to the respect for human rights and the protection of civic space and civil liberties. Yet the country is striving to do better. So with this, this OECD civic space scan, 
Can, can you share with us some of the key insights and, and the outcomes of, of the civic space scan? And how, how has this initiative helped bolster the country's open government work, vice versa, for a stronger democracy at home? Now I get also the video. <laughs> Hi again. Yes, uh, we just launched this uh, last Wednesday. So it's very new. And this uh, scan. And uh, it gives us very good data. And of course, the evidence and also lots of recommendations. It's uh, 18 pages. And I, I think that we have been in good level, but we have to do a lot to do after that scanning. And uh, we have so little time now. So I I'm not going through all these 18 pages, but uh, but you can believe that we take all these very seriously. We have already now make uh, set up this kind of cross-governmental group who are going through all these recommendations and prepare the implementation with them. Some of them, of course, they are carried forward existing program and project in this our open government work it includes there and of course we have the second one this kind of democracy program but there are also those uh, recommendations which takes a longer term preparatory work and maybe we need some other project with them and of course they also they are including and concern almost all the ministries, not only where I am, but many other, of course, if I, if I think about the schools and, and, and basic rights and they are in the other ministries. So uh, we have to join them also this implementation. But uh, I take two examples for you. One is the better reach of underrepresented groups in society. It's, in, it's in important, and I think that we already have taken very good steps in this uh, direction, if I think about this, uh, that open government strategy as well. We notice that we have those groups there. And of course, uh, the second one is uh, when we attend Sunday's Finnish lockdown dialogue is with this work with civil society organizations and they mentioned, they took them to the discuss because they, they reach those groups like prisoners of probation, uh, those uh, relatives of uh, mental health patients, uh, sex workers, other groups and their voice, they, they are not themselves coming up and take the floor. So these uh, NGOs are the, the will continue. And second one, the other recommendations uh, in further develop is a civil society academy, what we have uh, launched October 2020. And it's, a, uh, it's an idea is behind the train of dialogue on the changing roles of CSOs in Finnish society and how to best support and co cooperate with SEOs in the active. And that was we have made with, with OECD recommendations that the commi government commits the hosting of this civil society academy, they act annually and complements the initiative of organizing conference, forums, different kind of debates and so, and so on. And we have already launched this preparation of annual day of pilot in the CSO academy model in the regions. 
not only in national level, but also in the regions. And the last point, I truly recommend this uh, work to everybody, every country. It, it was very interesting to read the report and they are relevant, of course, now they have written to Finland, but I think that we have similarities with other countries, so we can use, use them also, uh, just learning for each other. And of course, uh, OECD is making this uh, good work, and it's very useful also to change the experience with the uh, uh, with uh, other countries and of course in uh, public governance. It would be truthful to speak through, uh, with the uh, with colleague in, in public government. So I think that uh, we will continue that a lot <laughs> because it was very interesting to read that report and it was good, good information to, to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for these insights. Um, I think absolutely, I would, I would agree with, uh, with your and also uh, Paul's recommendation to, to um, not only to go through with this, this inward looking civic space scan, um, to learn about your own, your own country's ability and, and the interplay between governments and, and civil society and, and citizens and their rights, um, but also to, to learn from other countries, as of course our contacts across countries uh, differ in many ways. Um, I think human rights and, and the interplay between citizens and state, um, there is uh, undoubtedly many, many crossovers that we can learn from. So I have one more question um, for, for Sonia next, uh, but I would like to take this opportunity to turn back to you, the participants, and um, encourage you to make good use of the chat and throw in your questions, because after this, we will turn to you and, and try to get some of your questions answered. So uh, before Q&A, um, Sonia, over to you in Canada. Um, my question for you is, um, as, as Assistant Secretary for Digital and Service Policies of the Government of Canada, you oversee Canada's digital government agenda. And from your point of view, I'd like to ask you, how does Canada's digital agenda then support the country's move towards uh, open government strategy? And how do you think digital tools and services, as, as you mentioned, can be leveraged even greater to foster a stronger democracy? Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Maria. Um, and I'm really glad actually to have the opportunity to speak a little bit to the importance of the intersection between digital and open, because I really feel it's, it's actually a very critical component and sometimes gets a little overlooked. Um, you know, when, and I'm going to bring it back, of course, a little bit to the current context about COVID-19, um, when, when, when it hit, like when the pandemic hit and pe people depended almost exclusively on digital tools to learn, to communicate, to connect with each other, but governments also um, had to depend on them to deliver programs and services safely to the people who needed them, much more than probably ever previously experienced. Um, and it's important it's important to remember that this dependence, this need for digital and connection, it continues to exist outside of the current circumstance. Um, it's a need, but it's also a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Um, in Canada, you know, and as, as with many, many other governments, we were able to rapidly deploy digital tools and services during the pandemic, both to, to support kind of internal government operations, but also how we supported our interfaces with our student, uh, with our with citizens, so that we were able to continue to deliver and to offer them the services that they need. And we were also able to, so, uh, to ramp up very quickly to provide uh, new programs and services to help address um, some of the urgent needs that kind of only arose in the context of the pandemic. Um, this was a great success in many regards, but it also created an expectation that we can continue as governments to develop and deliver services at speed and at scale. Um, services that aren't only open, um, but are secure, that are reliable, that are easy to use, and that are accessible on, on any digital device. So not everybody has the benefit of, you know, having a, a lovely, uh, uh, you know, a desktop computer in their own homes, right? A lot of people rely on their tablets or their iPads or their iPhones or, you know, other devices. 
Um, so in, in order to meet all of these expectations, we really need to transform ourselves as governments um, from an analog era to how we're used to operating to digital. And this goes beyond the simple digitization of existing services. Um, we need to bring citizens along with us on this process, on this road. So if we don't, if we don't include them in how we deliver this, uh, if we don't include them on the choices that are being made in the design of services, they don't work as well. Um, and, 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 and that it's critical for our own success. So we need them to come to the table um, and we need them to trust us as we're going through this process. And this is at the heart, I think, of democracy. Uh, we need citizens to trust us as we are working for them, and especially as we are transforming. Um, if you don't have citizen trust during transformation, transformation doesn't succeed. So transforming ourselves in the context of the digital era also has to include a transformation about how we engage with citizens, how we engage with people. How do we bring them into the policy development process? How do we set up our systems and our processes so that everything we develop is done in collaboration with the people who use them? Um, the move towards digital government is an amazing opportunity to enable greater openness and greater citizen engagement. And you know, for those of you who have you know worked more closely in digital, at its heart is, is, is really about designing for the user, designing for the citizens, designing for the people who are leveraging the technology to access something important. So whatever, what, what is that outcome you are trying to achieve? Um, you know, within Canada, you know, one of the things we're focusing on is working in the open as much as possible. And in fact, working in the open and collaborating widely are part of Canada's digital standards. So those form part of how you develop and deliver digital. Um, as, as part of our achieving our, our vision around this, we need to address culture uh, and we need to transform how we work. And this includes, as I noted, uh, working in the open and collaborating, making government data open by design. So in a way that respects privacy security, but it needs to be thought about at the inception of initiatives. And as we transition from legacy systems or existing infrastructure or information technology systems to more cloud-based systems, ensuring that our infrastructure processes and tools are in fact open by design and also ethical. Um, and I wanna expand a little bit on the legacy systems and about the importance of that. So uh, I think as many people who have worked in kind of the, the digital world recognize changing existing systems so retrofitting existing systems to enable different aspects including openness is always harder it's always harder it's always more expensive it's always more difficult and more challenging than building um, openness or other aspects into the design as from the outset of, of, of the development. So we need to de double down on our efforts in this regard um, for future initiatives. We need to build systems, but also services and policies that are open by design. Um, of course, this includes building in uh, security and privacy, so we don't open information where we shouldn't. But it also means accessibility by design, and that's something I think both the minister and others have, have noted. It's, it's about accessibility in terms of language, but also accessibility in terms of ensuring that persons with disabilities can also access them. And, you know, what we know is that, you know, this, this secure ethical, inclusive openness, it needs to be baked in and thought through from the outset of the processes and the development of these initiatives. So by putting these principles in place, which are at the heart of digital, we're laying foundations to be more open, uh, more agile, more user focused in the modernization of all stages of policy, program and service delivery. So we see the critical linkage between digital and open, which is why um, you know, our open government strategy will align with and will really reinforce uh, our, our, the, our move towards digital uh, within the government of Canada and the government's digital standards, working towards ensuring that we are uh, continuing to build and maintain trust and understanding the important role that openness plays in that regard. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Sonia, for, for this, this I've, I think, very well showcasing how, how, how intrinsically linked the digital agenda and the open agendas are, and also how mutually reinforcing they both are. Um, thank you to, to all the panelists for, for these, both of these rounds of questions. I think our, our, our heads are full, and um, 
there's lots to think about, and we still have some time for questions. So um, over to you, the audience. We have gathered a couple of questions. Um, I'm just coming up. So I will I will answer. So, okay, I'll bring in two different questions that we have, um, and perhaps I'll pose the first one to you, Elsa. Uh, the first question is from Joelle Grogan um, about open government reforms and international and multilateral organizations. So this question is where the pandemic has, has evidenced a primarily nationalist response in policy and regulatory decision-making in response to a global health emergency. What reforms or developments would you advocate for improving the multinational and international institutional cooperation and engagement, not only for global recovery, but also, to, uh, also in response to, to future emergencies? Elsa. Thank you very much, Marianne. This is a very, very rich, uh, very rich question, obviously. Um, three points come to mind. I mean, the, the first, because it's a, there are many levels in this question. Um, first, uh, and I think Sonia mentioned that uh, already, uh, the importance of participation in the design and implementation of recovery plans. Um, extremely important, but it needs also to be very well done. Uh, it's what we do with, the, with our principles on, on how to organize citizens' panel, uh, it's a way of just uh, doing that well, uh, because there is a risk. We just uh, we just launched a bureaucratic, uh, I mean, the report of a, following a bureaucratic exercise about the report on monitoring recommendation on lobbying. And one of the things that we say is that the other side of the coin about uh, putting uh, everything, listen about not not being organized enough to listen is that the capacity for uh, lobbying practices has increased through the digital means uh, and that uh, essentially through also social media but also has become more complex with the use of research organization and also some civil society organizations so when we organize these higher levels of participation in the design of the recovery plans we need to organize it very well to make sure that uh, it's the that it's the the right uh, the right governance behind, and uh, and avoid if you want uh, undue influence. Uh, and this is and right now we do not have the means to do that, uh, notably because of the because of, of the fact that uh, lobbying has become more complex uh, and is more difficult to track. Uh, but we will be updating our recommendation on our, on our say next months. Um, to, to try to tackle that. But so the first thing, the second thing is that, um, and I think this is implied in this, uh, in this question as well, is that there is a need to put an end or at least give, you know, the end of the, give, give light on the, on the end of the tunnel um, about the emergency uh, procedures that are reducing the, the civic space in many countries. Uh, it's time to, to reopen, um, to really uh, go for sunset closes on the, in, these, uh, in these different measures. Um, and that's a bit also what we would like to do with our civic space scans. And I, I thank the minister for the compliments to, to the team led by Alessandro Bellantoni on that, uh, and that are well deserved. Uh, the third, so international regulatory, international uh, cooperation. I mean, this is a very, very crucial agenda. I mentioned it a little bit when I talked about the, the our uh, evaluation, our analysis on trust in government institutions, we will be carrying out a big survey in the fall on trust in institutions uh, through the Public Governance Committee. Um, and uh, apart from the traditional ways of looking at trust, governments have been asking that we try to measure what are the levers for trust in global cooperation. Uh, indeed, as I mentioned earlier, it is understood now that trust in institutions will also be dependent on trust in uh, the capacity of our government, governments to work together. Uh, so we're approaching that a little bit uh, for the first time. It's very complicated. Uh, we, we're also approaching it from a capacity of domestic governments to do that uh, on you know, different, different levers. Uh, but what is very important also is that we find the ways collectively to have the right tools. And uh, for example, if you look at uh, digital, uh, you saw that uh, regarding taxation of uh, 
of, of multinational companies. We've made big progress politically uh, recently, but this is big for governments in the future. Uh, and this is big for trust in governments in the future, but there's also so much more to do on international cooperation on climate. And this will determine really the outcome of, uh, of citizens' trust in institutions. So this is, uh, this is my two cents uh, as a response to this very complex question. Thank you, Elsa, and uh, thank you, Dr. Grogan, for, for the great question. Um, moving along swiftly, we have another question uh, from Criona Brasil in Ireland about uh, OGP synergies and our strategic development goals. So the question is, how does OGP complement or differ from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? For smaller countries, it is critical, critical sorry, to have synergy to drive impactful outcomes. Paul, would you like to take this question? We have a choice. No, it's a great question. It's, um, and I think that synergy is, is not just for small countries. I can understand why sort of for small countries it's additionally important because there's only so much um, capacity um, that you have. Um, but I think the synergies and the complementarity between SDGs and national development plans and um, uh, open government plans is, is, is essential, right? You can't um, have um, all these things be separate because then they might not add up to more than the sum of the parts. Three elements. Um, one is, I think one fundamental difference is OGP very deliberately by design um, is not created as a standard setting partnership. So we're not telling our members what to do um, with the idea that what type of, of government reforms are needed and what is ambitious for a country will very much depend on the country. What is ambitious and needed for Finland will be different than what is ambitious and needed for Kenya. Um, so that's that's one. And I think that's a really important one. The SDGs, of course, are, are, are global targets set for every country in the world. And they're very, they're, they're very well picked and they're critical targets. Um, but I think how open government plays into it, it almost is as, as an approach that can support not just the um, SDG, which is about good governance, um, but actually every SDG. I was on a conversation on Friday about um, water and sanitation, and it's fascinating how um, open government approaches, how transparency and participation can actually be a critical factor in ensuring that, that clean and safe water reaches people, right? So I think that's how the two connect. Um, the open government is an approach that can help deliver um, the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second one is um, our approach very much is about um, collaboration and cooperation between countries also, right? Not that, that, it's, that it's different with the SDGs, but I think it's important. And again, the design principle of OGP is no matter what the country is, you can learn from each other. No matter where you are in your development path, your economic development, uh, you can inspire, support, and learn from each other. And one of my favorite examples of last year, uh, last year is, is, for example, Senegal and, um, and Canada have had exchanges about access to justice and open justice. And I think that's fascinating that two of these countries find each other on a topic like that, or in the past, Mexico and Georgia about access to information. Um, so those, I think, are the, the points. The third point I weaved it into my first one is, is um, that I think open government approaches really fit with all the SDGs, not just the one that is about open and good governance. Thank you, Paul, very much for, for your frank answer. Um, and also thank you to Criola in Ireland for the great question. Uh, I have one more question. And again, we still have a bit more time. So if, if you have any more burning questions, please throw them in the chat. Um, this is a question for our Minister Patero. Minister, a, reoccur a recurring topic in today's discussion is, is the issue of trust. And we've seen that across every single one of your answers. Um, based on your experience in Finland, how can open government reforms improve trust and, and as, as practically or as concretely as possible? Are there any trends from Finland that you could share with all of us? Over to you, Minister. Thank you. It's very big questions, and <laughs> I think that we, everyone has to think about that. 
I think that we have now good experience that we have go around the country many times. When we speak about the open government, when we speak about this strategy, when we speak about every reform in Finland, we speak uh, different part of Finland and different kind of group of people. NGOs, just the individual person, uh, of course the academic world, universities, and of course the local municipalities. And I think that it has helped a little bit because you know that we have now, we are voting on Wednesday, our social and health reform. And I think that we didn't success if we didn't have this kind of very straight discuss with, with the local level. I think it, it, it always help us not, to, or not only that information is open, we also have to be ourselves in the floor, in, in the field, in the, in, the, in the marketplace, just discuss, uh, discussing with the people. And that's my experience. It's very hard sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Also, for, for even just admitting that it's very hard, um, I think building trust is probably one of the, the, the hardest things that we humans can do among each other. Um, and, and indeed, it is not a given, it is earned. So thanks for sharing these, uh, these examples with us. Um, I, I have one more question for, for Sonia. Um, and Sonia, sorry to, to, to put all of you on the spot, um, but this is a, a question about the, the, what you were just talking about earlier, about the, the, the interplay between the digital and the open agendas um, going forward. Um, what is the role of the private sector in, in, in the interplay between private and government uh, and civil society in, in making that openness default? Oh. Hmm. So I, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, part of, um, you know, the, I think when we're talking about open government in the context of, uh, and it's interplay with the private sector, I think it's a very interesting conversation, right? And we, we see this a lot in terms of how do we enable things around, you know, corporate transparency and financial transparency and uh, lobbying and, and things like that. I think, um, in the context of digital, uh, you know, moving, uh, you know, digital initiatives through government and putting in place digital platforms uh, enables governments to actually leverage um, the skills and the um, the the strengths of the private sector in in delivering and iterating and moving uh, sometimes more in a more agile way um, than governments sometimes can, um, and so that's it's a it's a very important factor. Uh, in how uh, governments can implement digital and how they can adjust and, and pivot more quickly. So, you know, leveraging some of the best parts of the, um, how, how, how we can leverage some of the best parts of the, and aspects of the private sector in terms of delivering digital. Um, but I think that has to be accompanied as well as we've indicated by an openness and transparency about how we're leveraging the private sector. And so what role they're playing in the delivery of these systems um, so that you know it's very clear to people uh, how that's working. So I think private sector has a really key role to play. Um, but I think you know if we're able to, in the delivery of digital government, I think you know leveraging the principles of open government and ensuring kind of the transparency of how those uh, systems are leveraged uh, and the interplay of data Data across those systems, I think, is actually critical to success. Thank you, Sonia. Um, with that, I think I would like to to thank all of you again um, for for a really fantastic and very fruitful conversation that I think has has very well um, kicked off our week of of learning and sharing. So thank you very much um, to all my great speakers here and also to the, the participants for being um, so great with such good questions. Um, we, have, we have short of uh, five minutes left. I'd like to ask uh, each of our speakers to give uh, 60 seconds or less um, in, in closing. Perhaps we can start with Minister Patero. Would you like to kick us off? Oh yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> because uh, first I have to thank you, my colleague from, uh, from Canada. She mentioned this di digital services and it helps us a lot opening all the discussions. But then we also have to remember that we have some groups who can't use them or they use, don't use them. So we, we don't, uh, it's not possible only to trust these digital possibilities. And maybe that is the one point. And of course the big uh, question is that how we continue this fruitful discussion. And of course, OECD has a responsible of that. And I, and I hope that, and I encourage you to continue and keep touch with, with all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Well put. Um, I would like to move to Sonia next. Would you like to give 60 seconds or less to, to close it up? The elevator pitch. Um, so I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to the other panelists. Um, it's been a really great experience um, and for allowing me to share Canada's perspective on open government strategies. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, was very clear is that open government is not just about thinking what activities we're implementing, but about how, how we're doing it, how we're designing and delivering services, um, you know, to, to our citizens in a different way that are ways that are fit for open, uh, for an open and digital era. Um, we believe in, you know, personally that, you know, meeting the needs and expectations of our citizens uh, and users by mainstreaming transparency, accountability and participation uh, is, is key to helping to foster trust with, uh, within decision making. So I just want to thank you everybody for a really great and uh, really interesting uh, session today. Thank you, Sonia. Now over to, to you, Elsa, would you like to take the floor next? Thank you, Marianne. Thank you to all speakers. It's been great and, uh, and lots of uh, challenging thoughts. Um, yes, I, I just want to give um, a little bit of uh, this open government community is 10 years old now. So it's very vibrant. Uh, it's incredibly vibrant. It's full of passionate people who believe in, the, in what they are doing. And I would say um, uh, it's entering more a more mature phase uh, at a very challenging time. Um, it's uh, so we need to a little bit step up the game and, and really think also about those people that are non-believers, those people who are dissociating themselves from from democratic processes. How do they think? Of how can we relink with them? How can we reconnect? Uh, I believe myself that this will be absolutely crucial in the next 10 years uh, if we don't want to see our democracies go in the, the wrong path. Um, and for that, of course, we need to collect uh, evidence and, and, and impact, uh, an impact on those groups. Um, and of course, I mean, I just want to say that the OECD is, of course, uh, ready to help, uh, to help countries. Um, and that we need to do it in a coordinated manner, that the lack of trust is not only uh, domestic, it's actually very much uh, international now, it's a global issue. One uh, lack of trust in, in one country feeds another one. Um, so it's very important that countries remain coordinated and we're very happy to, to help share practices and connect our countries. Thank you very much. You here. Thank you, Elsa. And Paul, over to you. Thanks, Maria. And thank you for, for being such a good moderator. Thanks to the, to the other panelists. Um, three words I want to throw out. Do, dare, and drive. Um, do is, I think we really have to focus on implementation in the next phase of open government. Concrete promises are important, um, but concrete results change people's lives. And, and better democracy, which was the, the topic of today, doesn't just come from speeches and statements. Second on dare, um, we call the third phase deliberately open renewal, not reset or rebuild, because this is about making bold choices and in investment in a radically new society, I think. Bold choices, game-changing policies, inspiring reforms. There was an example in a newspaper over the weekend that, that, that had a headline that Norway's um, sovereign wealth fund missed out on $125 billion, billion in potential returns over the last three years because they invested in oil and gas not in green stocks. Next time, I hope the headline reads, Norway's sovereign wealth fund grew with an unprecedented 125 billion because they invested in green 
and not in oil and gas. So that type of big choices. And the third one I think is, is drive is leadership, leadership from, from Europe um, specifically. It has the advantage of European societies and corporations that have already a system to share, inspire and learn from each other. Um, and we've seen it the last year in action on vaccines and recovery. And I would really like to see Europe step up its role as a global influencer um, and start to shape much more global norms around green, around digital, around health, around democracy. Thank you, Paul. Very well said. And again, we're, we're just at the, the, the end of our hour. So I want to thank everyone again for, for spending the time with us and, and for this great conversation to launch the, the retreat. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your summer solstice and uh, a fantastic week of conversations and connections and learning and inspiration. Um, thanks again. Have a great day.